Lockdowns have hit some sectors much harder than others. According to the Beauty United Council of Ontario, 82% of beauty industry businesses in the province could face permanent closure due to this pandemic. And of the 200,000 people employed by the sector, they also point out that 80% are women. The personal care industry is hurting. With us to understand how badly in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Isabella Forglia is the owner of Botanica Luxury Spa. In St. Catharines, Ontario, Paola Girotti, chair of the nonprofit Beauty United Council of Ontario and owner of Sugar Moon Salon, which operates out of Burlington and Toronto. In Pickering, Ontario, Sean Lewis, also known as Bucky the Barber, owner of Custom Cuts, that's located in Pickering and Whitby. And in the west end of Ontario's capital city, Norm Wright, who's a color technician at Taz Hair Company. Hello to you all. Hello. Hello. I joke, I joke before that I had to make sure that I kind of looked half decent for this panel. Um, you know, but uh, all jokes aside, this year has been very difficult for you, uh, for your industry. I wanted to get um, an idea of what the past year has been like for you and Isabella, as is, as is our tradition, because you're the furthest away. I'll start with you. Um, it's been just absolutely unimaginably difficult, like just so financially straining and it's just been, it's, we've been left with feeling just so unessential after all of this. And Paola, how about you? For me, I have two thoughts. Um, one, personally, I'm, uh, obviously financially devastated. Um, I'm also a single mom raising two kids. Um, and so I have that parental aspect where my kids have been at home. And then I also have a team of 33. So professionally, I'm exhausted um, because we took on this, um, this role to really champion um, our industry uh, with government. And um, it's been very difficult to, to, um, uh, to work with uh, with with the premier after a year of closure. And Sean, what about you? I would say that it was very stressful, very very stressful, and uh, just not knowing when the doors are going to open, not knowing when the doors are going to close, has been has been tragic for 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 the for the mind and the mental for us, honestly. And Norm, what about you? We're all very very terrified about what the fate of our industry is going to be after this. Um, we have all tried to, to place logic on the decision-making process that our leaders are making, and clearly personal care hasn't been the culprit in this because we've been closed longer than any other sector um, in the, on the continent. So um, making us uh, bear the brunt of this has been um, very challenging. Um, I don't know if you had the chance to read the article from Matt Gurney, who is a journalist here, and he also writes for TVO.org. A couple of days ago, he had an article called Who's in Charge in Ontario and What the H-E Double Hockey Stick is Going On. Um, I'm just going to read an excerpt from that. Sheldon, if you could please bring the board up. Uh, Matt writes, there's plenty of other stuff to worry about to state the blindingly obvious. Ontario's ICUs are getting awfully damned full, and the impact of the latest stay-at-home order probably won't even begin to bring down daily case growth until next week at the earliest. We're in for a rough April and May. But the haircuts and patio story is still a small but telling hint that seemingly no one was paying attention at the highest levels as we plodded confidently and serenely into this disaster. Um, Isabella, those are some strong words from Matt. Can you give us a sense as to how the lockdown has affected you financially? Honestly, at this point, I'm, I'm at the point of bankruptcy. Like, I'm a new business owner. I'm 27. I'm in my second and a half year of business. And I've exhausted all of my savings, my husband's savings, we've got nothing left. And just to put things into perspective, I actually had my car repossessed on Monday because I've fallen behind with my payments and I've not received any type of funding from the government. I haven't even received the CRB, which is the $900 every two weeks. My application keeps getting denied and I've been waiting since January to get a response back with the Ontario Mainstream Grant as well. So at this point, I, I've got nothing left to lose. I've lost it all. 
Um, I think people watching and listening, because I think we've been hearing this from the government that there are supports for businesses and uh, people should uh, apply for these funds. There's money there and they should apply for it. But you just mentioned that you did apply for that those benefits. Mm -hmm. You haven't received them. Your car was repossessed. You want to work, but you're not oh. allowed to work. How, how does that feel? It's just it makes you feel so unimportant. And I've lost all of my motivation. I've lost all of my desire and my want to, to do anything. I'm, I'm stuck at home and I never in a million years would have thought that I would have to beg just to go to work, to make a living for myself. So to have to go through this for, at no fault of my own, and I know there's thousands of people in the same situation, it's it's mind blowing because we put so much faith in our leaders, we put so much faith in their decision making abilities, and we've been begging for months to lock us down hard. If they would have done this back in December when they had the um, first stay at home, or sorry, the second stay at home order, then maybe we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now. But we've sent hundreds of emails, we've called our premier, we've called our health minister with not even any type of respect back towards us to even answer our questions as to why we've been the industry that's been discriminated against. Uh, Paula, I just want to jump off a word that um, Isabella just used, an important. Um, you're the chair of the Beauty United Council of Ontario. Do you feel that that's how this government has treated your sector as unimportant? Well, I definitely think that there is a level of unfairness in how we've been treated. Um, they have a, a real health crisis on their hands. And um, certainly I wouldn't want to be a, a politician, but um, I think that what we are trying to get across as a sector is that there is a level of unfairness and we are looking to be treated fairly. Um, we've seen Premier Ford step up to the challenge with other industries, um, but we have not yet uh, been treated fairly by him. And we are going to hold him to his word the other day where he uh, was talking about our industry and saying, you know, trust me, I have your backs. Well, Mr. Premier, if you are listening, we are waiting. Um, we have a plan. What is the plan? So uh, Beauty United Council of Ontario um, is now working with and partnering with Maxil, who is uh, one of the leaders in dental hygiene and, and actually helped the dental hygienists actually get back to work last year. And because this government is so all about data, uh, what we do know is that uh, Maxil has the data that they've kept dental hygiene safe. And when you think about hygienists actually working in the mouth and all of the aerosolites that they, they create, um, our sector is nowhere near that type of high risk. And so yesterday, uh, in fact, actually, we, we released this to the news to let them know that we our sector is, is taking matters into our own hands um, to get the support um, of public health based on data from uh, Maxil and how they've been able to champion dental hygienists. So after this call, I'll be reaching out to the two others. Um, Norm and I work closely together on this mission and, um, and we'd love to be able to help you. Well, you mentioned that uh, the Premier mentioned your sector a couple of days ago. We actually have a, a clip of that. This was this past Tuesday. Sheldon, could you please roll? I look like a sheepdog and and uh, so we literally got some dog clippers and I got it on video to prove it, or I know you guys are gonna wanna see it, but my daughter that lives at home has never cut anyone's hair in their life. I just sat in the chair and said, honey, go to town. And uh, you know, we couldn't even figure out how to work these clippers and I grabbed them and zinged half my head so it's half bald on one side. And that, that's what happened. But you know, on a, on a more serious note, my, my heart breaks for these barbers and hairstylists, you know, that have been shut down forever. It really does. Uh, and and I, I'm gonna do everything I can to get you back open. Um, in fairness, when, we, when uh, that clip was shared on, um, on social media, I liked it. I thought it was very cute. I thought this is such a nice moment. Um, but then afterwards, I kind of thought about it differently. Norm, when you saw that clip, what went through your mind when you heard the premier mention your craft in that context? It's not the first time that's been mentioned like that. Uh, during the first lockdown, um, Medical Officer of Health Paul, Paul Romliotis uh, 
when asked about the personal care sector, said that it was suggested that it was more sanitary to stay home and cut your hair with dog clippers. And it's a testament to the lack of solidarity or compassion that this government municipally and provincially has for our sector. Um, the, 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 the contribution that hairdressers and personal care workers have given to our communities since their inception is vital. And I, I consider it an insult. And quite frankly, I would like to see that video. I, I, I would like to see um, him getting his hair cut by his daughter with dog clippers. I'm, you know, if, if, they're, if they choose to keep referencing um, the quality of and caliber of work that comes out of our sector in that uh, way, I'd like to see the video. Um, do you think that's part of the reason why your industry has been dismissed as being non-essential? Because people just write it off as, you know, um, as a vanity. I think that uh, our numbers um, as a group, as an entire sector, are too big for them to monitor. We don't have a governing body at this point. The Ontario College of Trades is who our, we pay our licensing dues to. And they... Um, are an umbrella for a number of different trades, so like carpentry and electricians. So the, the guidelines are non-specific. We have no one to answer to. So when I was invited to become part of Beauty United, I jumped on board with both feet because when when the initial lockdown was uh, first announced, the government gave us guidelines to follow, uh, signage, uh, We've all been able to put all the proper precautions in place to ensure our clients' safety, and they don't recognize it as credible, and they gave it to us. So when Paula uh, approached me with the, uh, the new IPAC certifications that would give us the same uh, infection prevention control as dentists have, that is a one step in getting us uh, to a table where we'll be, we'll be respected and taken more seriously. We've talked about the financial toll, uh, Sean, but what about the personal toll? What has, how does that contribute to what's happening this past year? The personal toll, I would say, uh, just a lot of stress, just not knowing where the, not knowing where your, how your bills are going to get paid. That's my biggest concern: is how are my bills going to get paid? Is my, is my credit going to be affected? My barbers were thinking about buying houses this year, and that's gone down the drain. All the money that's. Uh, all the money that we've saved for like the last two years thinking about buying houses, especially with this crazy house up and this crazy house pricing jumping up. And now we're all dipping into our savings just to pay the bills. The government, the same thing as the first lady. Um, I've, I've been waiting since January for my CERB. I've been waiting for at least two months, three months now for my rent subsidy. Everything is on retro. So like the bills are just, the bills are just piling up and it's, it's ridiculous because I don't see the help. I do not see the help. Like, how, like, if I didn't have this money to, if I didn't have the money in my banks saving money, I would have been out. I would have been totally out. I would have been totally broke. I would have been totally stressed. I would have been bankrupt. I probably would have lost my car too. And it's just, I don't see the help in the government. I, I don't see the help. Like, they say it's there, but being retro, retro to me means that they're going to pay me back. And what if you don't have the money to pay up front? How are they going to, you know what I mean? They're taking 100% away of our, of our income. And then they, 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 they ask us to pay 90% to 60%. How do you pay any percent when you have no job? It's and the, just, and I, I think, know. too, I think one of the difficult things, because in certain sectors, like the restaurant sector, they've been able to mm -hmm. pivot. And I hope I never use the pivot ever again after this pandemic is finished. Uh, but it's in certain industries, they've been able to um, adjust and maybe do delivery. But with your sector, they haven't been able to. But I'm also guessing that there's still people getting their hair done, right? There's probably like an underground um, economy happening now, isn't there? Sean? There could be people out there. There could be people out there cutting hair, but it, it, like I said, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be safe because if you're going house to house to house to house, it just wouldn't be safe. It's it's not a safe thing to do, but it's something that people probably would do because they don't want to lose their house, they don't want to lose their car, they have to feed their kids, they have they have all these bills. They're worrying about the future, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a good chance that you have barbers out there, salon people out there, just trying to make some type of living because. No one's really helping. And like I said, the retro is like, it's killing you. Every day you're checking the CRA pending, pending, pending. It's like you call the CRA, the CRA is telling you, uh, oh, you got to call validation. You got to call these people. You got to call those people. You're calling these people and nobody, nothing. There's no answer for you. You're, you're asking them what's going on. They, they're telling you they have no answer for you. So it's just crazy that you can't work for you. You can't, like the reason why we chose this, this industry is because we like the independence. 
We like to be able to make our own money. We like to be able to control our life. Mm-hmm. And right now it's like, it's just not in our hands right now. And it's just, it's just disturbing. Uh, and I think another thing that your industry offers is community. People go to um, the barber, to their hair salon, and you develop a very intimate relationship with those individuals. Have you seen, um, have you heard from people within the community that are lacking that connection and what's happening as a result of lack of that connection, Sean? Yes, I've actually, before the lockdown, I was talking with the police officers that get their hair cut here. I'm a judge here, and they were telling me that the communities, the communities committed, a lot of kids are committing, uh, committing suicides. People are stressed out totally. People are mentally getting sick because of this. And this is the community that we cut. People are, people are hurt. People don't know what to do next. And it's sad, man. It's really sad. It's hurting our customers. Customers are going all over the place trying to, it's, it's, it's not good at all, man. It's really, really bad. It's bad for the community. And Norma, I, I mentioned that, you know, um, restaurants have been able to pivot and do online or doing patio, but your industry doesn't really have that same kind of flexibility. How have some in your sector adapted to the lack of money coming in? All we're doing is incurring debt at this point um, and hoping that w- there will be an influx of clients when we uh, are finally allowed to open. But with the case numbers the way they are, th- there's there's no light at the end of this tunnel. This tunnel's getting darker. And uh, the, w- because of how vocal I've been on this, um, I receive a lot of messages from salon owners that have been, their, their businesses have been in their families for generations. I spoke to one gentleman the other day that has a, a salon in Vaughan that's uh, been open for 50 years, and he is now being forced to close. And th- 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 these people have nowhere to turn, and they feel like they've been completely abandoned. That must be a very desperate feeling. It's not uncommon. When you look at uh, the conversations I've had with everybody, uh, what Sean was mentioning, everybody can tell you a story about the uh, the rent subsidy uh, that's... Uh, that nobody's received anything for six months. People that were uh, awarded the $20,000 grant during the first lockdown still haven't received it. So going and having a press conference about how they're available and all these facilities and all these these options are available for people, they're just not materializing. And uh, that, needs to brought, be, that needs to be brought to the light. Um, you know, we are all, the one common denominator with every conversation I've had with people is while we all adhere to the strict restrictions and we're, we're trying to, uh, to stay home and, and make sure that we're not the reason for the spread of this virus, uh, then we, we look at the press conferences that, uh, th- that show the decision making from our municipal government especially. This time last year, Tory announced uh, the emergency closure of High Park and the banning of any selfies at the cherry blossoms. Now, our case numbers uh, th- at, on that press conference a year ago were 1,768. Yesterday morning, our case numbers were 4,750, and he opened High Park and said, proceed with caution. Businesses that are being forced to close at this point are looking at themselves going, how is this possible, and how does this make any sense? Isabella? I completely agree with that. It's just, it's honestly just so disheartening to see that we've been continuously left in the dust. Like, we are proactive in what we're trying to do to get ourselves and our clients back to our businesses safely. We've implemented every safety procedure they've asked. We've been governed by our health units and following their guidelines. So it just doesn't make any sense to us that we're the ones that are continuously left behind in these decision makings. Meanwhile, we are doing the best that we can. I had a friend, for example, her name is Meg. She owns Ink Factory in town. And her partner ended up taking a layoff when we were allowed in that four-day time period that they said that we could reopen. Meanwhile, they turned around and closed us back down again. Um, And now they're both out of work. So it just doesn't make any sense to me that they're saying all of these things. They're all false promises at the end of the day. And we're all losing everything that we have for for no reason. We haven't even been given a chance at this point. 
There's been a lot of back and forth. I mean, this past week, you were supposed to essentially be open until the cases went up again, and then we went into uh, another stay-at-home order. Um, if you could, uh, I'm assuming anyone, if someone from the government watching this, Isabella, what would you like to say to those people that are making the decisions? I'd just like for them to to just take a look and see like what the cases are in each region. Like I can definitely see in Southern Ontario, maybe it's just because of the population density and the fact that all of these other big industries aren't following the regulations that have been given out, that maybe there's a little bit of a boom in the cases there. But up in Northwestern Ontario, we're down under 100 active cases in our city. Um, there's a neighboring community, Fort Francis. They had one active case two weeks ago, and they are are now put into a gray lockdown. It just, it doesn't make sense how they're making these decisions and how they're just kind of lumping everything into, into um, a complete lockdown and that we haven't even been given the opportunity to kind of prove ourselves and show that we are not the problem. When everyone else was allowed to open at 25% capacity, why were we not included in that? If you were told that you could open tomorrow, would that help? It would start to help, but at this point, unfortunately, the damage is done. Um, it's going to take years to financially recover from this. It's going to take a lifetime to mentally recover from this. It's it's going to take a really, really, really long time to figure this out and to get back on our feet. Paula, uh, in the clip that we showed earlier, Premier Ford said that his heart goes out to your sector and that he would like to get you open uh, uh, back up. Um, yesterday, you were scheduled to meet with a representative from Minister Vic Fideli's office, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. How did that meeting go? Um, yeah, so we did meet with uh, one of the stakeholders from his office, and, and actually the meeting went extremely well. Um, that that office in particular, in particularly Minister Sakaria, um, they've been um, they've been listening. Um, you know, they've come to visit um, as well in person to really understand our our um, what we've done. So in terms of like you know adding barriers and in some salon and spas, there's massage therapy and aesthetics and massage therapy is open um, using the same door, the same protocol as we would have in, in um, with, with beauty. And so the meeting went well, we have a lot of work to do. Um, we've, we've obviously given them the plan for our reopen and we are seeking um, recovery money for our sector. And I, I echo what the others have said here. Um, unfortunately, the supports while we're grateful for them, they're slow, they're backdated. Um, for example, April rent, you can't even apply for until May. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out why we're paying the landlords when we're closed. It's just so bizarre to me that uh, we, you know, that the government has given them 100% of their income and we have mm -hmm. lost everything. It's very frustrating for us as a, as a group. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot of modifications. Look, the government has tried to do their best to get as much money out to a number of people early on. Uh, we just need to, we need to be treated fairly. And I'm really hoping that public health and all of the, the decision makers are watching this. We are going to hold you to your word. We need a meeting immediately. We are a sector that has been forgotten and we need immediate help. We are important and our lives are important. Sean, I saw you nodding your head when Paula was talking. Yeah, I just think they need to, um, I think they need to just come up with a better strategy. I just don't see, I don't see the strategy and uh, I don't see the strategy and what they're doing. Like, they're locking down, the numbers still go up, they open up, the numbers still go up. Like, I don't understand, the, I don't understand the strategy just like she said, we're paying rent to the, we're paying rent to our landlords, we're paying rent to Enbridge, we're paying our gas, light, we're paying all these bills, and like I said, our, our, our we're in the red zone and we're in retro, and we're not being paid back by the government. They're the same people that told us to lock down 100%, lock your store down. You're not making any money, and then they don't help us out, and it doesn't make any sense because not everybody has like, especially the people downtown, like. Imagine paying $10,000 rent every single month and you've been locked down for seven months and you owe $70,000 in rent 
and then you also owe gas bills and then you also owe this bill and then you also owe house bills if you have kids like it's, it's enough to make somebody go crazy and it's not fair and it's not nice and you would never expect that from your government and especially with ford saying how he cares about i don't i don't know man i don't see the care in that and if you if he does care hopefully we do see something immediately hopefully he sees us talking about this today and he understands that we are normal we are people and we're, we're struggling out here and it's not fair because we are the community we keep the community happy and we and everything that we do is for the community so i don't get it like i, I don't get why we would be treated like this and it's it's just not fair um, we only have a few minutes, but uh, some people say numbers talk. And I just found this uh, from Refinery29. As of March 13th, Statistics Canada reported that the personal care industry, your industry, have been responsible for 47 outbreaks and 401 cases across the country since the start of the pandemic. Um, and it was actually the lowest rate among similar businesses. Uh, for reference, food and retail stores have accounted for 634 outbreaks and 2,161 cases. So, Norm, when you do hear that um, there seems to be um, kind of questions around how those decisions are, are made and given that infection rates across the province and the country are going up with no sign yet of dropping uh, if you were in government with lives still at risk today what would you do to tweak the policy so that we can all stay safe I would use logic and, and fact and the data that they have, and I would close down the businesses that are being that are responsible for this. Instead of making us the culprit in this, we've been asked to incur a year-long debt, and uh, we're in danger of disappearing forever. And so, instead of satisfying the government, uh, the public's thirst for a culprit in all of this, and making it making it us, let's let's stop rewarding companies that aren't following restrictions and letting them record 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 earnings every month. And uh, let's let's get to the the root of the problem and and stop this before it gets completely out of hand. Their their projections for May are 12,000 cases a day. We've been closed since since uh, these things were under 800. We're not the reason for this. And Paula, I'll give you the last 30 seconds. Well, uh, I think I would listen to the doctors and really target where the source of the spread is. Um, they've known because they do have the data. And, you know, to support Angela, like if, if there's really that many, that little cases up there, I mean, you really have to look at this a little bit more regionally. Uh, but more importantly, I would like them um, to be grateful for the fact that we've sacrificed our businesses for a year for this cause, to help the community, to help COVID, to help all of this. And we need a meeting. We need immediate relief. We need them to respond um, and to make us important. Um, we are important, not just to our own lives, but we do, like Sean said, support the community. And everyone loves their barber or their hairdresser or their esthetician and, you know, their, their body art uh, professional. We represent all of them and um, we want to be treated fairly. Premier Ford, we want to be treated fairly. Thank you so much for all of your time tonight. We really appreciate your insight, and uh, we wish you best of luck in the next few months. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario and by viewers like you. Thank you.